Hey, my name's Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. The last time we talked about 12-year-old Jesus, after that narrative, Luke takes another big jump in the story of Jesus. Today, we are picking back up with one whose story is deeply intertwined with the story of Jesus. I'm talking about John the Baptist. Now, John is going to show us that our story is really meant to point us, to point other people to the story of Jesus. So here we go. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 1, quote, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee. And his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonius, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. End quote. In these first three verses, Luke drops a lot of names, and he also lists their titles. What's cool is that we can and have historically verified every single person on that list. If you will remember, Luke told us that his goal was to give a reliable and trustworthy account of the story of Jesus. When we can historically verify people or places, it gives us all the more evidence that we can trust the story Luke is telling us. Now, there are many reasons to believe the Bible is true. Verifiable names of people and places at the right time is one of the things on that list. If you'll remember in a previous episode, we mentioned how fulfilled prophecy is another piece of evidence that proves the validity of the Bible. The list of reasons to believe God's word is true and accurate is ever-growing. This is a reliable and trustworthy book. One of the reasons Luke is name-dropping all these people is to give us a timestamp. So I will tell you what year Luke is pointing to. Maybe the biggest name on the list is this guy named Tiberius Caesar. Now, he is the stepson of Caesar Augustus. If you will remember, that was the guy who put out the decree that resulted in Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem just before Jesus was born. Now, Caesar Augustus died in 14 AD, and in that year, Tiberius Caesar took over his stepdad's rule of the Roman Empire. So, if we're in the 15th year of his reign, 14 plus 15, that puts us at 29 AD. In verse 2, Luke moves his focus from the political world to the religious world. He stops listing politicians, and he mentions that there are two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, Now, some might consider this to be an error on Luke's part, because typically there's only one man in the office of high priest. Luke was not Jewish, so you could kind of understand how someone who is not Jewish living in a Jewish world could make a mistake like that. But in reality, it shows us that Luke really understood what was going on in this Jewish world. He really knew his stuff. He had accurate information to work with. So let me explain. Technically, Annas had stepped down from the office of high priest, and his son-in-law, Caiaphas, had filled the role. But sometimes, what is technically accurate and what is actually reality are two different things. So picture this. Your church has a senior pastor who has been there for a long, long time. He's well-loved, he's influential, he's really a giant of a man, if you will. Now imagine, one day, when he reaches a certain age, he retires. But in his retirement, he chooses to stay in the same church. So he's not the the senior pastor anymore, he's a church member. Someone else fills his office. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think the average church member would stop referring to this guy as pastor? I mean, is he technically still a pastor? No, technically he's not still a pastor. Would he be considered a pastor by most of that congregation? Yes, by most he would be still considered a pastor. That's what's going on here. In this Jewish world, in the city of Jerusalem, Annas was retired. But he still had so much influence. He was influential, he was well-loved, so people considered both he and Caiaphas to be high priest. All that to say, Luke was right. When he is describing the situation, when he is describing this moment in time, he is doing so accurately. Now, it is worth noting here that on this impressive list of men, God's word doesn't come to a ruler. It doesn't come to a politician. It doesn't come to the emperor. It doesn't come to one of the two high priests. No, 
It doesn't come to any of them. It says the word of God came to John, the son of a priest named Zechariah. Please don't forget this. Look, an infinite God that has all the resources, all the ability, all the power that we could ever imagine, he is not impressed with human titles. He is not impressed with our achievements or any so-called power that we pretend that we have. He doesn't look on the outside. He doesn't look to the resume like normal people do. He looks at the heart as only he can. We're going to pick back up in verse 7. Quote, He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brought of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. End quote. Now, there are a lot of ways one could describe John the Baptist, but I'm going to tell you one thing. John the Baptist was not known for being a motivational speaker. Look at verse 7. He calls them vipers, right? So viper is a generic term here for a poisonous snake. They're lethal. It was also used as a way to say, your father is the serpent, meaning you're of Satan. You're not of God. You're not following after the one true God. You're following after the enemy of God, Satan himself. You are evil to the core. Now, that is not going to be found in any motivational speech you ever hear, because that wasn't his goal, right? John here is questioning their hearts. It's great to show up for preaching and baptism. Those are beautiful things, but why are you showing up? It's good to come out to where the word of God is preached for sure. God wants that in your life. He wanted it in their life too. But John looks at them and he says, are you here for God or are you here because someone sent you? Where's your heart at? The why you do something is just as important as what you're doing. Matthew 6 is found right at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount goes from Matthew chapter 5 through 7. So 6 is right there in the middle. In that sermon, Jesus calls out the religious leaders of the day for doing good things for the wrong reasons. Giving to the poor, praying, fasting, all great things. But when they're doing those things so that other people will see them and celebrate them, it reveals that something in their heart is off. Good things are meant to be an overflow of worship for the good God, not a spotlight that says, hey, look at me, look what I'm doing. So in this context, John is telling them that there are two kinds of trees, two types of people, if you will. The first tree describes people who are putting their faith in their family tree, if you will. They thought, hey, I'm a descendant from Abraham. I'm good. I'm just wrapped up in what God promised to Abraham. I don't have to worry about a thing. But we do that today, too. So many assume they're good before God because their family goes to church. They grew up in a a Christian area like the South. So many people claim the name Christian who do not know Christ. What does he say happens to the people who assume they're good because of their family or their community or some other thing? He said the axe is ready to chop them down. Again, this guy was not a motivational speaker. At the end of the day, if our faith is in anything other than Jesus, it's pointless. It's powerless. Anyone who claims to be a Christian but is trusting anyone or anything other than Jesus for their salvation is a fake, is a fraud, is a people pleaser. Every person that puts their faith in anything other than Jesus, well, the wrath of God awaits them. Judgment awaits. He says, the axe is ready. But there's another kind of tree, right? There's the good tree. This is a tree that describes a person who bears fruit in keeping with repentance. And that has to be the rhythm of a believer's life. If we are pursuing God, it's not to get something. It's to have a relationship with God. God is the treasure, not what he can give us. As we pursue him, we hear his word. We obey it. We turn from the stuff that we thought was right, that we wanted, and we follow after what God says is good. Even if no one else does, even if no one else cares, even if there's no spotlight about the good things that we are doing. Now that all sounds simple enough, right? But it begs the question of how. The tree that bears fruit is alive. And the only way one is alive is if their faith, if their trust, if their confidence is genuinely and authentically in God himself. They have believed the good news that God is making a way of salvation. The Holy Spirit has come to them and is making them more like Jesus. Look, the good trees are alive 
because the living God has come to make his home in them. They're not alive because of what they've done. They're not alive because of who they're related to or where they live. They can only be made alive by the living God coming and making them alive. Then and only then can they bear fruit in keeping with repentance because these are not works of man. They are works of God. We're going to keep moving to verse 15. Quote, As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether He might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. End quote. There's a lot of things to draw out of these verses, but I really want to highlight something that is very applicable to us. John the Baptist was better than any preacher you've ever heard in your whole life, and it's not even close. John the Baptist was such a good preacher that people thought he might be the Messiah, that he might be the one that God was sending into the world to save the world. I'm going to say that means that John was really, really good at what he was called to do. He was successful. You're not going to be mistaken for the Savior of the world without something special in what you're doing. Anytime we have success, it can be tempting for us to make that success or to make those accomplishments or to make the benefits the accomplishments bring us. We can make all that stuff about us. And this is especially true in today's world. Too many people place their hopes in becoming famous, going viral, being a celebrity, an influencer, being someone. Somehow we've connected that to our worth. I've seen celebrities, usually professional athletes, act as though someone's opinions were invalid on social media because they didn't have that many social media followers. As if fame could add anything to someone's worth. Fame, influence, popularity, they do not equal worth. We were never meant to be at the center of the universe. It doesn't take a long look at Hollywood to see that fame can be so crushing. Look, we treat celebrities as though they were gods, and no one is able to bear the weight of that kind of worship. No one, that is, except for Jesus. We shouldn't be surprised at the moral and social devastation in our celebrities. They weren't meant to be the star of the show. We're not meant to be the star of the show. Jesus is the only one who can carry the weight in a healthy way. John understood that his life was about Jesus. Remember, we're applying this to us, right? So when we read our Bible, one question that is always helpful for us to ask, what does this teach me about following Jesus? Sometimes that means there is an example in the passage we should follow, and this is one of those cases. John the Baptist shows us an incredible example to follow. He understood one life-changing truth so perfectly well. Are you ready for it? It's not about me. That's it. That's simple, right? It's not about me. Look at what John the Baptist said. He said, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He immediately points the finger, aims the spotlight at Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's like, this guy, this Jesus is so great. I am not worthy to get down on the ground and untie his shoes. That's a statement. And that is a clear understanding. It's not about me. One way that I believe the world is affecting the church, and I think this is actually pretty clear and obvious, is that inside the church and church culture, specifically I'm really talking about here in America, our churches can become so consumeristic. Now, being consumeristic means there are people asking the question, what can this church give me? What can this church do for me? How can I benefit from being a part of this church? Does this church meet my preferences? Do they do it the way that I want to do it? Now, the cultural climate we live in is going to cheer that on, right? It's going to tell you in no matter what sphere of life you're in to make it about you. But Jesus preached the opposite, and so did John the Baptist. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus told his disciples something that we need to remember. He said, quote, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. End quote. If we took an honest look at our life, what would we be more likely to find? 
Would you find yourself making it all about you and what you want, about your preferences, or would you see yourself denying yourself for the sake of Jesus? Would you see yourself following John the Baptist's lead and saying, hey, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals? Would you see yourself following his lead and making it as much about Jesus as you possibly can? Here's what I want us to reflect on here. When are you tempted to make it all about you? Do you even realize you're doing it? Listen, there are are two responses to Jesus. One of those responses says, Lord, I want my will to be done. That's the opposite of the cross, right? That's the opposite of denying oneself. That is pursuing this consumeristic culture in our world. That is not of Jesus. But the other response says, Lord, let thy will be done. In other words, I want to take up my cross. I want to deny myself. I want to put the spotlight on Jesus, not on me, because I see he is the one who is worth everything. Now, which response sounds more like you? Lord, I want my will to be done, or Lord, let thy will be done? Okay, I mean, really... Shakespearean English aside, I don't think any of us say thy, thee, thou, ye, whatever, but it gets at the question, who's going to be the boss of my life? Whose will is most important in my life? Is it my will or his? All right, we have just a few more verses here. Verse 18 and following, quote, So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison, end quote. John was a really successful preacher. Some people thought he might even be the Messiah. Remember, he did what was right. He wanted to honor God with his life. And at some point in John's ministry, he calls out Herod. Now, this is one of the sons of the Herod that the wise men met, okay? This Herod was just as evil as his dad. Remember, his dad saw no problem with having a bunch of baby boys up to two years old killed. That is an evil, evil thing. It doesn't get much more evil than murdering infants. Herod the Tetrarch followed in his dad's evil footsteps. He allegedly even drowned one of his own sons in a swimming pool out of paranoia. The offense that is mentioned in verse 19 is that he divorced his own wife so that he could marry his brother's wife. Now, his brother was still alive. He just didn't have the power to stop this from happening. The story of Herod the Tetrarch is evil, it's disgusting, and it's gross. Matthew 14 and Mark 6 record the death of John the Baptist. Luke does not. One year on Herod the Tetrarch's birthday, Herodias, his daughter, dances for him. Now, just keep this in mind, Herod's stepdaughter and his biological niece, okay? It says that her dancing pleased Herod. And he offered anything to her, even up to half his kingdom. The word pleased here is as gross as it sounds. It was evil. It was disgusting. I can't emphasize that enough. Herod the Tetrarch, really like all the other Herods, serve as the opposite of John the Baptist. Where John made his life about Jesus, the Herods made their life about themselves. When life is about you and the greatest things in life revolve around you getting what you want, it is truly incredible and disgusting despicable, the sinful and evil behavior in yourself that you can rationalize. Let me say that again. When life is about you and the greatest things in life revolve around you getting what you want, it is truly incredible, it is truly despicable, the sinful and evil behaviors in yourself that you can rationalize. John the Baptist called Herod out for his evil behavior. He called it sin, and that's exactly what it is. John was courageous to call out a king. He courageously did the right thing, and he was thrown in jail for it. Now, John would never leave prison, for one day he would be beheaded, referencing the story in Matthew and Mark that we just mentioned. From the outside, it is easy to discount John the Baptist. He was poor, he was arrested, he was executed. On the other hand, Herod was rich, and he got everything he wanted in life. The world would call John a loser and Herod the winner. Yet, as Jesus said in Mark 8, 36, quote, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul, end quote. Because listen, this is important for us to understand. It's not comfortable, but it's important. On this day, we are almost 2,000 years later, okay? For on this day, nearly 2,000 years later, John is still 
enjoying his God in heaven. Like he's still having a party. He is still full of joy. He is now experiencing love and peace and joy like he never could have imagined on earth. But Herod, on the other hand, is still suffering his punishment in hell. And you know what? In 2,000 more years, the same will be true. John will be enjoying God in heaven and Herod will be suffering in hell. When years are no longer counted, both will still be true. John will be in heaven. Herod will be in hell. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, to get everything he thinks he wants in this life, but to forfeit his soul, to forfeit his eternity? It is so easy for people to measure God's will by how easy things are going. Like if something's going well or without an obstacle, it must have been God's will and desire for that to happen, right? John is evidence that that's not always the case. Sometimes you can do the right thing in the right way and you can meet resistance. You can meet consequences. We often think of consequences being a punishment for a mistake or a wrong choice or a sin that we've committed. And and sometimes they are, but sometimes, sometimes we can be doing the right thing with the right motivation, and those good actions can have consequences too. John did not end up in prison because he was in sin. John was not beheaded because he was in sin. He was thrown in prison and he was beheaded because he was obedient. And actually, if we're following God, we should expect that kind of resistance in our life. There is an enemy that we face who wants us to be discouraged, who wants things to be hard, who wants us to give up. But here is the thing. We serve and worship a God who is greater and more powerful than that enemy. Look, we have to understand that resistance is not a stop sign. And what's more is there are so many examples of that in the Bible. Think about it. David was so faithful, but he had to run for his life and hide in caves because Saul was jealous. Daniel was faithful. He was thrown into a lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were faithful, refused to worship false idol. What happened to them? Thrown into a furnace. I would call that resistance. Peter was thrown in prison because he preached about Jesus. Paul was beaten, imprisoned, shipwrecked, stoned, left for dead, all because he faithfully followed and served the Lord. You might even be thinking, hey, there's a pretty important one we're missing here. And you're right. Jesus Christ himself, he only did what was right. He only only did the right thing for the right reason. And what happened? He suffered. He was crucified because he was walking in righteousness. As we end today's episode, I simply want to say this. God calls us to center our lives around him, not ourselves. Making life about God is a good and right thing. Thing. We will find joy and peace in Him. That doesn't mean life will be easy. That doesn't mean circumstances will go our way. Actually, it could mean the opposite. Our circumstances could actually get so much more difficult. But listen to these familiar words. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What we see in the life and ministry of John the Baptist is that it is truly worth it to center our lives on God and not ourselves. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. End quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because he gives purpose. And that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.